Good morning. We are so very glad that you are here with us. We are continuing in a series this morning called our Summer Playlist, and it's all from the book of Psalms, and we're on Psalm 4 this morning. And uh, before we get started, let's pray together. God, you are so good, and we thank you that we get to be here with each other and with you. We thank you that we get to sing to you and we get to sing about you. And Father, as we open up your word this morning, give us hearts to hear from you and give us minds to absorb what you have for us. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus so that you are seen and I am not and you are heard and I am not because you and you alone have the ability, this, the unique ability, the special ability to change us. So give us a willing heart to, to experience that this morning. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said Amen. Uh, typically, um, when we talk about worship, and Paul does such a great job of music and picking songs and all that kind of stuff, and uh, in Bible college, um, when I was in Bible college many, many years ago, you know, there was a line of thought that said, okay, right before you get up to preach, what should that song be, and what should it feel like, and what should happen? And so there was a line of thought that said, oh, that song should be really, really uplifting and energetic so that when the preacher gets up, they're already way up here. And then there's another line of thought that was kind of neutral, and then there's another line of thought that said, no, um, have that song be a little slower and a little more mellow, and so that when the preacher gets up, he is able to, to make whatever move, for lack of a better term, with the crowd and with what's happening. And so I tended to be the guy that was like, no, I kind of want you here, so that when I get up, because I'm wound like an eight-day clock most of the time, right? Um, so I wanted to get up and just go nuts and, and bring you up to wherever I, I was already at like five hours ago. So um, this morning, our first question is a bummer. Uh, and it's a bummer because it's a question that none of us would ever admit to. And, and it's a bummer because it is... Um, it, it forces us to stand in front of a mirror longer than what we like. And so from Psalm chapter 4, our very first question this morning is, what do I do when God is not enough? And for some, that sounds very offensive. Well, how can you say God is not enough? Well, I don't know how old you are. I know how old I am, and I know what I've lived through. And on any given crisis... In any given problem, in any given dilemma, in, in any given moment in the story of my life where literally everything was crumbling around me, you do ponder, is God, are you enough? Now, if we're honest about that question, it leads us down a very specific path. Because if we do say, God, you are not enough, then where do we turn? If we do say that, God, you are not enough, then what other options do I have to get me through this thing I'm living through? Where do I turn? And so, God, if you're not enough, then who is or what is enough? And where do I find that thing or that person that will be enough? God, if you're not enough, what are my other options? And so maybe you're a person that's very self-reliant, or you tell yourself you're self-reliant. It's very different, isn't it? Yeah. Because we were, not to meant, we were not built or meant to go through this life alone, and certainly not built or meant to go through this life without a relationship with the God of heaven. But when we get to that point of saying, God, are you really enough? Where do we turn? Maybe you find that uh, you're finding some kind of temporary hope in a relationship. It's this man, it's this woman. It's you're living vicariously through your kids or your career or the house you live in or the car you drive or your level of success that you have reached or have not reached. And so we are surrounded at all times by these things that we are tempted to replace God with in the hopes that they will be enough. And so what do we do with the question of, God, are you really enough? Because if we're being really transparent, that creates such dilemma in our hearts. 
Because God is enough when life is good. When your bills are paid. When you have more money than you do month. But when you have more month than you do money, that's when you ask the question. You've gone through a bad relationship and things are ending on on whatever level for whatever reasons. Well, God, what do I do now? Because my whole life was wrapped up in her or in him. You're sending your kids off to college and now you're empty nesters and you're looking at a spouse and going, what now? Or you've lost a job or you're retired and now you're looking at a certain amount of time and you're trying to figure out, what do I do now with my life? The question of whether God is enough or not really is only asked in times of pain. But when you just got a raise or you just got something that you've been anticipating, that question doesn't even come into play then. You're not even thinking those terms then. It's kind of odd about our hearts, isn't it? How we relate to God based on our circumstances. Well, Psalm 4, we're gonna, I'm going to give you just three things this morning to help us through that question of what do I do if I'm wrestling with God being enough for my life, God being enough for my pain, God being enough for my suffering, God being enough for my questions, God being enough for my loneliness, God being enough when I'm hurting. What do I do in those situations? And maybe your life You have no idea what that's like. If you have yet to experience hurt, hang on. It's coming. It's on its way. It may not be tomorrow or next month, but we live in a world that is cursed by sin, and with that curse comes pain and heartache and brokenness and broken people. So what do I do when I'm wrestling with whether God is enough? Psalm chapter 4, the first three verses, we see a, I don't know how you pray. Um, I know how I pray. I know how David prays because David is the default prayer at lunch, (laughs) right? Every time we're at lunch, David prays over lunch. And it's usually, we are are both, our eyes are open, we have tater tots on our fork, and David is praying. (laughs) I can tell you what David Hall eats at every restaurant we go to. And as he is looking at the menu and going, I think I'll go for, and I'll say he'll have the dirty bird and tater tots. That's what he gets at the Hebrew and Grill. Now for the Lucky Duck, he gets the fish sandwich and fries, maybe tots, tots. I get the same sandwich and broccoli because I love Jesus. Now, (laughs) now... (laughs) So what we see in these first three verses is an interesting interaction. And it's an interesting interaction because it's a dialogue and not a monologue. Most of our prayer life is a monologue. We're just telling God about this thing going on in our lives. We want this or this is a problem. I don't know what to do. And so it feels like a monologue. But our prayer life is really never a monologue. Because if you want to hear from God, then... Open your Bible. God will talk to you nonstop. As a matter of fact, God never shuts up. He is constantly talking to us. Constantly. And if we are looking, we will find what we are looking for. And so open your Bible. Read your Bible. I'm not saying you start in Genesis and go through Revelation. I'll be honest, that will drive you crazy. There's a lot of stuff in there. A lot of he begat him and him begat that person. There's a lot of names that I can't pronounce. And so I don't, that's not how I read my Bible. In Psalms, I'll read, uh, I've probably read Psalm 4 a hundred times, over and over and over and over and over again. But if you want to hear from God, then read your Bible. So we have an interesting uh, interaction here. This is King David, uh, who wrote this psalm, and he has a brief conversation with God. He says, answer me when I call to you. (laughs) That's. That's gutsy. Let's be honest. God, answer me. I'm calling out to you. Answer me. Oh, my righteous God, give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. God, are you listening? Because this is really bad. 
and I don't know how to get out of this. I can't solve this problem on my own. God, are you even listening to me? Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me. He, God, are you listening? Can you hear me? That's David's first comment to God. Answer me. Now, we've probably said that to more than one child. Answer me. Answer me. When I lived in Indiana, not far from here, Caleb, who is now 28, he'll be 29 in a couple months. Caleb was four. We had not lived in this house very long. We knew most of our neighbors who lived very close, and I had a green pickup truck. It was an F-150, had a cap on it. I had my tools in the back of it, so we're just house stuff. His, uh, Madison was maybe just born. She was not very old. She was a newborn. And so we're just going about today like we all go about our day. But we can't find Caleb. So m my boys are me, right? I mean, growing up, I lived the Lord of the Flies. I mean, we were just bohemian. We were nuts. We, we played in the woods from the time the sun went up until the sun went down. We just ran amok. My older brother and I and all of our friends, we just lived literally chaotic lives. So when my boys especially behaved that way, that did not phase me at all. I'm like, that's exactly what boys should do, right? So we can't find Caleb. We're calling for him, calling for him, yelling for him. He does not answer. So at that point, a sm maybe a small amount of panic set in on my part, a large amount of panic set on his mother's part, right? So we're looking around. I open up the back of my truck. I look in there. I don't see anything. Put it back down. We're still yelling for him. Now the neighbors are involved. We're all calling for Caleb, calling for Caleb. And finally, we hear him answer, and he's in the back of my truck. Dude, I just opened this up and called your name in it. I opened the, the cap and said, Caleb, and you didn't answer me. What is wrong with you? Now the father takes his belt off. The mom is, oh, baby, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. We're going to break this right now. David says, answer me when I call to you. What a great moment of desperation for David. This is David's first barrage in Psalm 4 to God. God answers in a very interesting way. He says, how long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? David says, be merciful to me. Send me some relief. Answer me. I'm calling out to you. And God says, um, how long will you love delusions? How long will you seek false gods? That doesn't seem like an answer, does it? You know why? Because when I call out to God, I have a very specific answer in mind. I want this. I want this to happen. I want this to change. I want this thing. I want that thing. It is very, very tunnel vision oriented. And God is not a tunnel vision God. And so, when David says, I need relief, I need help, and God says, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you disrespect me? How long will you think that you, what you want is the most important thing? How long will you be proud? How long will you tell yourself that you are self-sufficient and you don't need me until life is so overwhelming and then you run to me? How long will you love delusions? Uh, how long will you seek false gods now my guess is most of us probably don't have some statue in our kitchen that we carved out of a tree in our backyard and we pray to it every day we don't have those false gods because we are much more sophisticated some of us drove a false god to church today <laughs> or maybe wrote it Or you got it out of your back of your car and you put it on your golf cart and you played with the false god yesterday and you didn't play well. That's a confession. 
or you drive through the ATM of your false god. Or every Monday you go into your false god because that false god gives you a sense of worth and a sense of value and it's really just a job. And so we have these little subtle false gods in our lives that we rely on our value. You want to know what your false god is? Ask yourself what's giving you the most value in your life. I love to work and I love to work. I love the kind of work I do. I, uh, David sees me every Wednesday, and there are days that I, I should take off my clothes and burn them because they smell so bad. They're sweaty and dirty, and I'm like, I can't go in this restaurant. But money's money, so I go in. Um, but if I get my value from that, what happens when I can't do that anymore? I'm mean, no longer valuable. What happens if you can't sing as well as you used to? Are you no longer valuable? So you retire now, and you look around and go, now what do I do? Do not become the person that has nothing to do and all day to do it. Give your life away. That's, what you ha that's why you have it. How long, will you become to, how long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Then David says again, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. So David makes a comment, God gives this crazy, does not seem connected answer to it, but it is, and then David comes back and says, oh, I am set apart. I am set apart. I am no longer like everybody else, and neither are you. So you are set apart for a reason. So when I'm struggling with whether God is enough, is it because I'm not doing what God wants me to do? God has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. So when I'm struggling with whether God is enough for me, I, there, there's, the first thing we have to do is I have to trust his word. Now I can trust his word because I know it. And I know it because I read it. And I make it a part of my daily life. It's not just something I hear on a Sunday morning for however long my sermons last. And you see the words on the screen and you go, oh, that's nice. I feel warm and fuzzy. Let's go to Bob Evans. You think, really? The, God's word was not to make you feel warm and fuzzy. God's word was given as a foundation for your life. And to give you hope for a future. So when, I, when, I, when I'm struggling with whether God is enough to solve my problems, to give me relief, to rescue me, I have to trust his word. Psalm 119 verse 49. Psalm 119 out of all, probably all the sections of scripture for in all of the Bible talks more about God's word as a collective than anything else. He says, remember your word, remember your word to your servant. You have given me hope. Remember your word to your servant. David says, God, remember what you told me. You ever tell your kid you're, you're going to take him for ice cream and then you forgot? Nothing worse can happen to a child. <laughs> Nothing worse. You said we could get ice cream. That's before you're an idiot. <laughs> right? Remember, God, what you told me. Remember what you told me. You have given me hope. God, your word gives me hope. Now, there's an important word in there that, that I hadn't considered until this morning. He says, remember your word to your servant. I think that's a big word. It's probably a more significant word in this, in, in verse 49 than probably anything else in that verse. Because that's an identifier. You want to have hope? You want to be able to trust God? Then know who you are in Him. And I'm your servant. I'm your servant. That's why people sing on the stage, because they're, they're servants. That's why people help back there, because they're servants. That's why David preaches, because he's a servant. That's why people help in Vacation Bible School, because they're servants. 
That's why there's a lady in our church who all the flowers you see out there and the stuff around here, she waters them. And I was here one afternoon and she was mulching. And she loves to be dirty. Like her hands, I mean, she's got dirt all over and she's sweating and she's just the kindest, sweetest lady. And I'm thinking, if this were up to me, this would be gravel. <laughs> this would be gravel. gravel. What color? Painted, Painted gravel. gravel. It would be pink. <laughs> it would probably be pink. Um, but it would be gravel. And so she is so good at that. And why? Because we serve. Remember your word to your servant. Remember your word to your servant. You were built for that. You were built to serve. Not If that were up to me, that is not my gift. Those are not my talents. That is not what's going to happen. I have one plant in my house that I have to remember every Sunday to water. And I didn't water it this morning. And that's typically what I do. I make my coffee. While the coffee's going in the Keurig... I get water, I take my medicine, and I take that same cup, and I walk into the other room, and I water that plant, and that plant he got watered today. And what I know about me is I'm going to forget. That plant is not going to get watered today. Now, thankfully, that plant is pretty resilient. But you are built to be servants. And so when he says, remember your word to your servant, remember what you told me because I have this relationship with you you are the God of the universe, and I am not, and I am built to serve you. And you have given me hope. So in my life, and I'm worried that God, or I'm considering, or I'm panicked, that God is just not enough. And really, we get to the understanding of God not We wonder whether God's enough because he's not doing what we want him to do when we want him to do it. That's fatal thinking. God, you could heal me, but you didn't. You could have saved this person, but you didn't. You could have kept this bad thing happening, but you didn't. You have given me hope. Now remember what I just said to you. God, you are not fulfilling my list of demands. Because we're going to pick that up in a few minutes. Psalm 119, verse 89, he says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. God, your word never changes. It is firm. It's a foundation for my life, for all the pain, for all the hurt, all of those things. Your word, God, your word stands firm. So when I'm thinking that, God, you're not enough, your word is enough. I can run to it. I can run to your word. So I need to trust God's word. The second set of verses in Psalm 4, or verses 4 and 5. Now this seems odd and out of place in the middle of this conversation with God. He says, in your anger, don't sin. When you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. In your anger, don't sin. So I've just given God my list of demands, and he is failing me. I'm going to be mad. Huh. Does it make sense now? So when you're angry, don't sin. Don't blame God. And this is what happens a lot. We make foolish, selfish choices, and then we blame God for the outcome. God, how can you let this happen? And God's going, because that's what you did. You behaved this way. This is the outcome of it. Why are you blaming me? Uh, just recently, these two brothers were fighting, little kids, elementary school age, right? And they're having at it. And these two boys are, the younger boy is nuts, like crazy. I, he's got a short fuse, and when it's time to fight, he's on, right? So much as an adult, you go, Hey, somebody needs to do something. So they're fighting. I mean, they're hitting each other with everything they, they can. The older boy, the older brother, gets the short end of the stick. And he's quick to cry. He looks at his mother and says, Why didn't you stop us? <laughs> True story. And she goes, You could have stopped any time. We could have hurt each other. That's what he said. Yeah. In your anger, do not sin. When you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. 
Imagine the change that would come about in your life when you just searched your heart. God, what's in me? Why is that in there? Does that need to go? Am I thinking wrong about that? If so, show me. Silence is such a rare commodity today. We can't sit and be quiet. It's our phones are on all the time. We're watching this, we're watching that. We're, it it's never, ever ends. And your anger do not send when you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. So let's jump back to the first brothers that Scripture records. It's a brother named Cain and it's a brother named Abel. Abel was a shepherd, took care of sheep, had livestock. Cain was a farmer and a very good one. And so as their lives play out, mom and dad taught them, hey, we sinned against God. And when that happened, God took a lamb and he killed that lamb and it shed its blood and by that now we wear clothes and that's why you wear clothes and blah, blah, blah. And so there was a time where they had to make sacrifices and Abel took the, takes the best lamb from his flock and he, and he kills it and he sheds its blood. And uh, there's no way they could have known that that was a picture of Jesus, but they just knew this is what obedience looks like. And so Cain does what we all do. He takes the best he has and he offers it to God. But that's not what God asked for. So that wasn't the right sacrifice. And so he gives his vegetables to God, and God says, that's, bud, that's not what I asked for. Abel did the right thing. And all Cain had to do was be humble, take his vegetables to his brother and say, hey, I need to trade you for the best lamb you have left. And thereby had a blood sacrifice to offer. That's not what Cain does. So when God shows up and says, um, dude, you knew the right thing to do and you didn't choose it. Cain is jealous and he, in, in the field he, he kills his brother and God comes and says, well, where's, where's your brother? Now you understand when God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. What's in your heart? God's not asking you because he doesn't know. He wants you to know. He wants you to be honest with a person in the mirror. He wants you to be reflective. He wants you to be self-aware. He wants you to see what's broken in you. He wants you to stop telling yourself how good of a person you are. Stop telling yourself how good of a gardener you are and how great your tomatoes look. So, Cain, where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. God already knows the answer to that question. Yes, you are. God says, you know, Cain, um, you knew the right thing to do and you didn't do it. And sin was crouching at your door. Sin was crouching at your door because you didn't offer the right sacrifice. And you let it in and it has had its way with you. Because you didn't offer the right sacrifice. And you didn't trust in the Lord. You trusted in your best behavior. So, I need to trust in God's process. That the way he says things will work are going to be the best way for them to work. Even if I don't understand it. We live in such a culture that we will avoid pain and discomfort at any cost. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Really? Really? So what do you think is going to help you grow and change? You're spared from any pain. You're spared from any accountability. You're spared from any, any responsibility. That you will grow up to be one of the most shallow human beings ever. Because you've never been able to suffer. You've never been allowed to suffer. You've never had to be inconvenienced. You've never been uncomfortable. So you don't trust God's process. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Now, that last part is very interesting. It's about worrying about the future. But the first part is more compelling. Uh, things are going to happen in your life you have no control over. 
And God allows great things in your life. And he's also going to allow sadness in your life. He's going to allow pain into your life. That is not the question. The question is, what will you do with those? So we will trust God's process when life is good and it's easy and things are going our way, or at least what we think is our way. But when life is hard, we're saying, oh God, take this away from me. I don't want this hurt. I don't want this pain. I've never been a person that shies away from sadness. I don't mind sadness. I don't run to it. That's crazy. (laughs) But I'm not saying I'm crazy. I have a doctor's note. (laughs) But what I am saying is if you avoid sadness at all cost, what are you learning? So when when there's sadness in your life, we got to pray with some people out side this morning who had some family losses and man that hurt and you could see on their faces they were they were hurting inside and crying and it was don't avoid that be in that sadness that's okay you can't live there forever but understand that sadness is a part of life and sadness teaches you a lot of things far more than happiness will ever ever teach you The Bible says about Jesus, he was a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Though I myself have reasons, this is the Apostle Paul talking. Before I read this, we'll leave that on the screen, so if you want to cheat and read ahead, you can. But the Apostle Paul used to be a guy named Saul. Not a great guy when he came to the church. But he had a fantastic education because of who he was. Though I myself have no reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in who they are as a person in the flesh, I have more. He says, I have a lot of reasons to brag, just so you know. I'm a big deal. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of, Be- of, of, the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. I knew a lot of the stuff. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. Legalistic righteousness. It's about how you look and how you sound in church. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, and you don't date girls who do. You looked really nice on the outside and you used the right church words, and, but you never did anything meaningful for the cause of Christ. You looked great and you used the right words. And that's as far as it went. So there's a process in his life that God used Saul and all the stuff he learned and all of experiences to become Paul. That's not fun. Paul later on in his life says, I have a thorn in my flesh. There's this thing that is, is in my life and I can't get rid of it. And I've asked God to remove it three times and God has told me no every single time. Be, and Paul says, because my weakness, in my weakness, God looks fantastic. I have postulated more than once that the thorn in, in, in Paul's side was his memory of the life he used to have when he tortured people from the church, that he would take you out of this place today and he would take you down the street in the center of town and all the people around would stone you to death while your family watched. And then a few years later, when Saul becomes Paul, he comes back to this town and he preaches in our church to your widow. And you can't escape that. And so a lot of times in our lives, we don't want the pain of the process. We'd just rather escape that. God, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to lose. I don't want to suffer. I don't, want to, I don't even want to be inconvenienced. When I came here this morning, the train was coming through the tracks. Anybody else get caught in that train? Oh, it's horrible. It's so inconvenient. It's just a train. There's a line of traffic. And I'm sure somebody was late for something somewhere. But we don't even want to be inconvenienced, let alone suffer. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, he says that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Was anybody caught in the storm yesterday? Did anybody see the clouds coming through yesterday? Wasn't that gorgeous? Oh, it was beautiful. And I happened to be on the golf course and was coming through. And guys, and I'm, and I'm walking. And guys are stopping on their golf carts. They're going, Brother Will, have you seen the radar? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen the radar. We're playing this out. And they stop and show me the radar. And we're going, no, we're not. What an inconvenience. And that's it. God allows great things in our lives, whether you are following Jesus or not following Jesus. Life is going to happen to you. The key is that in that process, that you're able to trust God and run to him when life is hard. So our very last section, and we're going to wrap up here very quickly. Verse 6 through 8, this is the last part of, of Psalm 4. He says, many are asking... Okay, I'm going to tell you something about David and I in leadership. If you ever come to us and say, people are saying, we are not going to listen to you. We're not. Because the people that you're talking about that are saying something is you. You know, people said, Dave, that you, oh, don't do that. Many people, who are the many, right? They're the mysterious masses that everyone speaks for. Now, maybe you don't know about that about church leadership, but now you do. So if you've got a problem with David or I, you just look at us and go, hey, when you said this, it hurt my feelings. Great. I can much better deal with that than the mysterious masses, right? Okay. And you, if you're in leadership at all, you know what that's like. Many are asking, who can show us any good? He says, let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than what? Than their grain and new wine abound. So no matter what anybody else is going to do or tell me or anything else, God, it is you that gives me greater joy. It's you. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, and make me dwell in safety. I will sleep in peace because my joy comes from you and nobody else can take that from me. So I will trust in God's provision. When I'm, when I'm struggling with God being enough, I will trust in his word, I will trust in his process, and I will trust in his provision. Isaiah 64, 4 says, Since ancient times no one has heard nor ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait of those who wait. And we, we don't see God working because he's way behind us. And we're looking around going, come on, Jesus, catch up. I got stuff to do. And God's going, no, no, I'm, I'm still here where you should be. You act on behalf of those who wait for him. God's provision is such an interesting thing because sometimes we miss it because of our timing or our agenda. I'm going to tell you two stories and we'll read our last verse. Memorial, the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, I was coming home from a place that I frequent and listen to concerts and stuff, and I'm in just south of Owenton, Kentucky, which is not far from here as a crow flies, and it's 1130 at night, and a deer comes out of nowhere, and I hit it with my Jeep going about 60. I was going 60. I don't know how fast the deer was going. I know how fast it was going after I hit it. Does almost $15,000 worth of damage to my Jeep. So I get out, um, stuff is just hanging off of it. I'm disconnecting stuff I can, throw it in the back. There's a puddle of liquid. I'm going, oh, don't let it be the radiator. It's just windshield washer fluid. So I was able to get home. If I'd been on my motorcycle, I'd have been dead. I'd have been dead on sight. So in all of that inconvenience, I'm going, you know, God, you spared me because I, my, my, I ride my motorcycle there all the time. So because of that, now I'm riding my motorcycle all the time. <laughs> and, and I went up to Indianapolis, above Indianapolis, to visit a dear friend of David and I. And I was pulling my motorcycle. I was pulling my trailer with my motorcycle. 
I have a small trailer. It's it's wrapped in the Amer. It's got a. It looks like the American flag. It's a great trailer. The only reason I bought it was to put my golf clubs in it. It's the only reason I own it. So I am 35 minutes from my friend's house, and I'm on I-69, northeast of Indianapolis, and I feel the motorcycle is squishy under me, like it's on Jello. I'm like ah, uh, I don't like that feeling. So I get off, and there's a big wide shoulder. So I get off the shoulder, and where I stopped, you could see in the back tire a screw that was an inch and a half long in my rear tire on my motorcycle. God, this is not funny. Really? Now what I know is this. I was only 35 minutes from my friend's home. If I'd been an hour from my friend's home, that would have been a whole other story. So I was close enough to get help. So Mark comes. You can't plug that tire, so put some air in it, a can of fix a flat, basically. And I'm able to limp up the highway during rush hour, going 20 miles an hour on a motorcycle, pulling a trailer. I'm not happy. But less than maybe a quarter or a half mile up the road is construction zone with no shoulder. If I'd gotten a flat there, I would be dead. That construction lasted for a couple miles. No shoulder, nowhere to pull off. And so I limp up the road. There's a place that Mark knew of that could put a tire on. They had one tire that fit the back of my motorcycle. It's on it right now. Now, if you want to go out and touch it, you can, because that tire cost me $369. <laughs> I will charge you a dollar per touch, which means that in this room, everybody has to touch it five times. And I'll break even. But in all of that, there is just this God's provision of, oh, this happened to you here, not there. And just up the road, there was this place. Because Harley was closed. They were in, I was, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. Harley wasn't even open yet. And so in the middle of all that discomfort and inconvenience, there is still this God's provision that's hard to see when you're in it. Psalm 145, verse 16, he says, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. And you're going to live off anybody's hand, you're going to live off of God's. He says, you open your hand and you give every living thing, not just your children, but every living thing, you satisfy them. John 12, 43 now we're going to end on a controversial statement. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. And no wonder you're disappointed all the time. Because you're not looking at God's provision. You're looking at what other people say about you. You love to have somebody pat you on the back. I have lunch. I love David Hall. I've told you this all the time. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known. I have lunch with him every Wednesday. He never pats me on the back. No, I'm just kidding. He does really every time. Every time we leave lunch, we hug each other, say, I love you, and I'll see you soon. That's what we do. Um, but he's talking about a very specific mindset. You love the praise of people more than you love God saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because God's provision in praise is eternal. Eternal. On any given Sunday, I'm going to preach a lemon. A lemon. And you're all going to walk out of here going, what was that? I didn't understand a thing he said. And if you're our guest today, good luck. I don't know what to tell you. But on any given Sunday, it might be a, a lemon and some, for somebody. And somebody else might be going, oh, that's exactly what I needed to hear. But we can be so caught up in the praise of people. And what we know is if that's what you love, the praise of people will, will be all you ever get. And you'll miss out on God's provision because you're looking at everybody else around you. So then, in closing, when we are struggling with God being enough for whatever we're going through in our lives, whatever that problem is, whatever that dilemma, whatever that crisis, or whatever it is, I have to trust his word. It's always there. It's always true. It never, ever fails. I have to trust the process that God is taking me to through because it might hurt for a little while but it won't hurt forever 
And I have to trust his provision. That God loves me. God will do good for me. God loves to be good to his children. God's provision is eternal. Never, ever fails. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word, for your process, and for your provision. Thank you that you really love your kids. And your love never, ever fails us. Father, help us that we will abandon that that's just a clever church saying. But that is a Monday saying. That is a Tuesday truth. That is every single day of our lives, regardless of what we're going through whether it's something fun and laughing and happy or whether it hurts and we are in solitude, that you love your children and you're trustworthy. Father, give us a great day and we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we said, amen.